I am very honored to have uh, Elder Roberta Price, who uh, I am so proud became Dr. Elder Roberta Price just yesterday and received her honorary doctorate from UBC. Um, and she's going to get us started in a good way um, and welcome us to this space today. Elder Roberta. Hi, Chico. Thanks so much, Brittany. And I'm just placing my cedar headband on my head and I have my cedar boughs. And some of our teachings from our elders is that when you put on parts of your regalia or your full regalia, you're giving an indication to the ancestors and the creator that you're going to share some important words and perhaps share ceremony. So thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Hi, Chico. Hi, Chico, CM, Siaya. Greetings and welcome, everyone. As Co-Salish Matriarch and Elder, I wish to give a very warm thank you to all my relatives on the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil for welcoming me to live in the unceded lands of my relatives, Musqueam, in Richmond for 41 years now. As Co-Salish Matriarch and Elder, I wish to give each and every one a very warm welcome who live, work, and play, give and receive service, teach and learn on our unceded, ancestral, and occupied lands of my relatives, Musqueam, Squamish, tsleil as I share many, many times on Zoom each day, wherever you may be, give time to give reflection, give honor and thanks to all the ancestors of the lands in which you live, work, and play on. Thanks so much, everyone. Always holding my hands up in honor and thanks to my beautiful teaching elders, Elder Vince Stogan from Musqueam, Elder Bob George from Slaywitz, always following in their footsteps uh, respectfully. So I'll start us off with a blessing and a prayer. Thank you so much, everyone. Haichka, Haichka Osiam, Osiam. We give you many, many thanks, Creator, for bringing us all together in this very wide virtual circle in such a warm and respectful way. We ask, Creator, that you bless our minds, our hearts, our bodies, our spirits. So when we think our thoughts, they are good, positive, and respectful. When we speak our words, they are good, positive, and respectful. We call upon you, Creator, to bless the food and drink we put in to nourish our bodies on our journeys to wellness and strength. We give you kind thanks each and every day, Creator, for the special blessings of protection you bring down upon all the beautiful people who are working so very, very hard in so many ways during this pandemic for all illnesses, for the safe delivery of our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, and especially for the ongoing opioid crisis. Continue to bless and protect them and their families, Creator. We kindly and respectfully ask you, Creator, to wrap each and every one of us and all of our loved ones in your warmest blanket of protection as we all journey through this part of the journey of our lives. Help us each to keep safe in our travels, both near and far, Creator. We always give you many, many thanks, Creator, as we ask you to bring all of your blessings down upon all the ones that are hurting, all the ones that are hungry, all the ones without homes, and especially, Creator, all the ones that are hurting. Haichka, haichka osiam, osiam. Thank you so much, everyone. And I'll pass the cedar boughs over to you, Brittany. Osiem, Osiem. Thank you, Elder Roberta, for the warm welcome. I'd like to invite any of our participants to also um, acknowledge the land and territory that they are joining us from in the chat box, if they can. Um, um, we are very honored today to host Miranda Kelly, who is the Director of Indigenous Women and Family Health for Vancouver Coastal Health, Indigenous Health. I am so honored and privileged to have her join uh, the team that I work on as well. Um, and she's gonna speak to us today about decolonizing Indigenous birth work and reproductive health. Miranda Kelly Tillian is of Stalo and mixed settler ancestry. She was raised in her home community of Sawali First Nation near Chilliwack, BC, and has kinship ties to Cowichans, the Nemo and Sumas First Nations. Miranda has a Bachelor of Science degree in biology and psychology from the University of Victoria and a Master of Public Health from the University of British Columbia. Since 2007, she has held positions in Indigenous health research, planning, policy, education, engagement, and community care. 
passionate about Indigenous peoples reclaiming authority as decision makers in their own health and well being. Miranda strives to create a better world through principles of Indigenous wellness and decolonizing approaches. After the birth of her second child, she was called to birth work, serving as a full spectrum doula with the Equatal Indigenous Doula Collective. She also helped co create and facilitate Indigenous doula training and prenatal curriculum targeted towards Indigenous families. In February 2021, she joined the Vancouver Coastal Health Team as the Director of Indigenous Women and Family Health. Welcome, Miranda, and we're really excited and honoured to hear from you today. Thank you so much, Brittany. <clears throat> and thank you to Elder Roberta for starting us off in a good way and for sitting beside me today. Oops. Let me see, I need to share my slides here first. Share screen. Okay, hopefully you are all seeing a map. Yes, okay, good. So thank you, I want to acknowledge that I'm calling in today from the unceded ancestral lands of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh. Um, but also acknowledge that as part of Vancouver Coastal um, Health Authority, we serve the whole Vancouver Coastal Region, which includes 14 First Nations communities. So in addition to Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, we also serve um, Heltsik, Kitasu, Hehe, Lillooet, and Kwakwa, Newhalk, Samaquam, Shisha, Skatin, Slyamin, Moikino, and Hatsa. So I want to acknowledge that um, these boundaries of our regional health authorities are colonial boundaries um, and don't define how we as Indigenous people relate to one another across our territories, but they do impact the service delivery of healthcare. Um, so thank you, Brittany, for introducing me. Um, I'll add that my pronouns are she, her, um, and I'm an uninvited guest on these lands, um, but privileged to be um, born and raised in the Stalo territory of my, my people um, and raised in my home village of Sawali. Um, and it's, it's an honor to be on these lands of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh where I was able to birth my babies and raise my babies and get married um, and work and live and play. And I want to acknowledge, um, so these photos on the top right side is my, um, my dad's mom, my grandma, Doreen Kelly, who passed away before I was born. Um, she served as an LPN um, across Coast Salish territory. Um, she worked in Victoria Ho Hospital. I believe she worked in Tifino, um, Kokolitsa TB Hospital. And, um, and she worked in Ch Chilak General Hospital as well on the children's ward. Um, and the next photo below is me and my dad. Um, my dad is Grand Chief Doug Kelly. He's been an elected leader um, for the Stalo people for pretty much his whole adulthood. Um, and he's worked very tirelessly in the transformation of First Nations health governance here in BC. Um, and so I'm third generation health careers, at least third generation. I don't know beyond that how, how many other healers or, or people who supported wellness um, came before my grandma. Um, but I'm very proud to be third generation and to, um, to learn from my family and learn from um, many others, including my dear elder here and my sister, Brittany. Um, it's a privilege to do this work and serve our people. Um, the, the next photo down is me when I was 12, I think. Um, so I was the youngest of three girls until my mother blessed me with a little brother when I was 12. Um, and I like looking back at this picture because I think it's foreshadowing <laughs> to the, the role that I would end up having. So in addition to being a granddaughter and a daughter and a sister, um, my two older sisters also blessed me each with a niece. So I'm an auntie um, and now a mother. And I like to say that my first daughter called me to motherhood and my second daughter called me to birth work. 
um, my own experiences of birthing my babies and raising my babies was really transformative for me uh, and made me think differently about how I want to approach my career in health and where I want to focus my energy. And really it called me to um, use my knowledge, use my skills, my expertise and my lived experience to help others. Um, so these photos on the left are me. The top is when I was co-facilitating some Indigenous doula training. Um, I, I don't know if you can tell, I was having so much fun. <laughs> I love talking about babies and placentas and, and everything birth related. And the, the photo below is um, when I was supporting a family in hospital as a doula and that was a, a planned C-section delivery. And I was very um, blessed, felt very fortunate that I was welcomed into the OR to be able to support uh, that family in welcoming their baby. Um, so I, as, as Brittany mentioned, I, I worked as a, a, a doula, a full spectrum doula and a childbirth educator um, for about two and a half years prior to coming to Vancouver Coastal Health. Um, and it was a beautiful work, spiritual work. And I'm really blessed to have been able to learn from um, the other members of the Equatal Indigenous Doula Collective and to um, co-facilitate with them the, the Indigenous Doula training and to help develop Indigenous prenatal curriculum. Um, and I bring all of these perspectives into my work with Vancouver Coastal Health as a director of Indigenous Women and Family Health. And I want to acknowledge the gratitude that I have for all of my ancestors, all of the teachers that I've had over um, the course of my career in health, um, and also the families that so graciously allowed me to walk beside them and invited me in to witness their sacred um, welcoming of babies to their families. Um, for me, sitting in the, the birth space, it has been a really sacred and transformative um, experience for me spiritually and culturally, and really informs my work going forward. So we don't have time today to go through the whole history of settler colonialism in Canada. Um, I'm really hoping that for most people on the call, you'll be relatively familiar with what the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples is, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada and the um, inquiry and the final report of that inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and, and Two-Spirit um, LGBTQ um, relatives from our communities. Um, so if you are not familiar familiar with these, then that's your homework for today is to go look up these reports and, and gain a better understanding of the impacts of settler colonialism in general in Canada. But today I want to talk to more specifically how settler colonialism and um, policies of, of colonialism have impacted birth. Um, so here I'm framing birth as a site of ongoing colonization. And I think it's really apparent, um, you know, in the news recently that these are current events. These are not historical events. These continue to impact lives today. Um, so with the creation of Canada, we saw um, Canada adopt a, 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 a system of um, provinces having um, jurisdiction over health care. Um, but an exception to that would be for um, First Nations. Uh, through the Indian Act, um, the federal government um, took responsibility or jurisdiction over healthcare services for First Nations on reserve. Um, and that was kind of the root of some of the jurisdictional gaps that we continue to see today um, between um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous and, and within Indigenous groups, differences between access to services for folks on reserve, officer status, non-status. Um, but something else that the Indian Act did is it created reserves um, and it, it really impacted the way that we access our lands as Indigenous people. And, um, and that has obviously very wide implications for our health and well-being if you consider, um, you know, that the the uh, reserves that were created um, sometimes were in um, areas where it really um, cut off or restricted access to um, hunting or harvesting areas, um, fishing areas um, that our people used, and also that the um, infrastructure on reserves is often um, very lacking. Um, and even still today, we have communities that don't have access to clean water, um, that have poor housing quality. And so you can see how the creation of reserves started to, um, you know, impact wellness of our people. Um, and in the early 1900s, um, Health Canada started employing um, nurses, 
nurse midwives and peas um, to be able to support um, nursing stations in these um, reserve communities um, to enable birth to happen in the community. Uh, but with the, the um, the poor state of conditions in on the on reserve life, um, it led to um, poorer outcomes for births happening in those communities. So uh, around you know 1920s to to 40s, and really still even continuing today, we do see First Nations experiencing disproportionately high rates of maternal and infant mortality. Um, and around that same period, we also saw legislation, um, the Sexual Sterilization Act. This was um, legislation in Alberta and also British Columbia um, that essentially allowed um, you know, sterilization of, of people, not just Indigenous people, but Indigenous people were um, disproportionately impacted by these policies. Um, and you can see how there's this um, policy trend of um, of separating Indigenous people from the land and also separating Indigenous infants and children from their people, from their families. Um, you know, around this same time period, we also have the creation of residential schools and, and children being taken away from their families in that way. And with sterilization, you have children being taken away from their families before they're even conceived. Um, so in 1935, we also see um, the, the policy that of birth location that impacts all Canadians, not just Indigenous, indigenous people, but um, now this is the time where we start to see that we need to have, um, there's mandated that physicians and nurses need to attend births. Um, so this impacts our ability as Indigenous people to have our traditional midwives supporting birth um, now that, uh, that it is required that a physician or a nurse be the one to support births. And around 1942, there was a proposal um, by Indigenous Affairs to increase um, support of home birth. Um, and that was more or less for um, cost saving measures, um, not necessarily because that's what the community was asking for or, or for the overall wellness um, of birth, but to reduce um, costs for the federal government. And however, that was denied due to poor hygiene on reserve. And, and there was, um, you know, uh, um, physicians and nurses not wanting to go attend births um, in, in the reserves on, in homes because of the, the lack of infrastructure and poor quality. Um, and so around the late, late 1960s, um, you know, the federal government cites maternal and child health as a top priority and starts implementing an evacuation policy, which basically means that for folks who are pregnant, um, they have to leave their community often around 36 or 37 weeks um, gestation, so maybe a month or so before their due date, um, to go to a often um, southern or larger city setting to um, give birth away from their home. Um, and around the same time as well in the 1960s, you see um, a trend towards closure of residential schools and into the 60s scoop where then child welfare started um, you know, taking over that role that residential school had of um, separating children from their families. What I find um, interesting here and what I wanted to point out is that, you know, at the, at the, um, at contact and before the creation of, of Canada as a country, um, what did birth look like? You know, for our great, 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 great grandparents, um, what did birth look like? As both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, it probably looked fairly similar. Um, you know, the physiology of birth itself hasn't changed in this time period. Um, but what we've seen change here, you know, across this timeline is we've seen policies change, we've seen health infrastructure change, um, we've seen, um, you know, technology, medical advancements, um, we've seen societal norms and cultural practices drastically change, politics, access to food, access to land, um, nutrition, societal structures, economies, so, so there's all of these other impacts, um, you know, on our lives that have impacted birth, not the physiology of birth, but everything that surrounds births and supports birth. So I couldn't fit the whole time frame into one slide. So here's another slide where we start to see um, a bit of a shift. Um, in the early 1970s, we see the repeal of the um, Sexual Sterilization Act. Um, 
but I just want to point out here that just because legislation is appealed or because policy change, that doesn't always translate into change in practice um, or to change in attitudes or societal norms or beliefs. Um, what's missing here also is the, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples in 1996. Um, 1998, we see the Health Professions Act in BC, um, you know, designate midwifery as a regulated healthcare profession in BC. And if anyone here um, is a, an expert on this act, I'd love to hear from you because there is a clause in there that is an exception for um, Aboriginal midwives who were practicing prior to this legislation to be able to continue to practice their um, Aboriginal midwifery, midwifery practices. Um, but it also does specify that it has to be on reserve. Um, and so I'm curious about that clause, the history of that clause and what the intent of that clause is, because I think if it's meant to be supporting us to have our traditional Indigenous midwives continuing to support birth today, I don't think it's doing what it intends. Um, I think we need a lot stronger wording um, in the Health Professions Act to support Indigenous midwives to practice as the way we've always practiced on these lands since time immemorial. So in the early 2000s, we also start seeing a lot of closures of rural maternity care. And this really also um, you know, impacts that evacu evacuation policy. Now people are having to travel even further when they leave the communities to go birth their babies, um, which just makes it that much harder for them to continue to have the support of their family in the community um, and to um, feel that sense of safety of home um, when they're birthing so far away from home. Um, and there also has been a lot of um, research, and I, I really um, uh, um, referencing here um, the work of Jude Cornelson and her colleagues um, who have done um, research to demonstrate that there also are um, increased rates of adverse perinatal outcomes the further that someone has to travel to birth. So around this time, we also see a shift in First Nations health governance, and that isn't reflected here. That's its own timeline with a lot of work um, underway. I think if you're really interested in learning more, you can go visit the um, First Nations Health Authority website to learn more about that ongoing um, transformation of First Nations health governance here in BC. Um, but I do think it's worth mentioning that there has been a lot of work ongoing um, through this period uh, to try to um, shift and reclaim um, First Nations ownership and um, sovereignty in our health um, services and, and healthcare decision making. And we start to see a lot of truth telling now occurring in this era where we have, you know, 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, the 94 calls to action. Um, in 2008, the First Nations Health Authority and the Provincial Health Officer um, put out uh, a report that um, again, confirmed that First Nations continue to experience disproportionately high rates of infant mortality. Um, despite you know many people wanting to try to close that gap um, there's still challenges here with that and 2019 we we have the final report from the inquiry uh, into missing murdered indigenous women and girls and two-spirit and lgbtq relatives um, and also in 2019 um, i believe in the fall we had bc um, ban the practice of birth alerts. So um, this practice that was essentially, um, you know, flagging Indigenous parents coming into the hospital to birth their babies to social workers. Um, and that was really, um, you know, contributing to the apprehension of Indigenous newborns um, right from their parents right after birth, um, which you can imagine is really devastating and just continuing that colonial um, practice of removing babies from their families. We also have BC passing the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, um, DRIPA, and there's ongoing work now into developing the action plan around that. And I think this is a really important point to um, look at all of the policies that have existed since the beginning of Canada that have contributed to um, colonizing birth and how we can try to walk that back. Um, through the DRIPA uh, legislation and action plan. 
Um, and then, of course, in 2020, um, you know, we're all aware of the impact the pandemic has had. Um, and probably there's a lot of ways that we still haven't even identified what the long lasting implications of the pandemic have been, but we do know that um, that some populations, including Indigenous people, have been, you know, disproportionately impacted. And I certainly saw this in my birth work, um, you know, as a doula, it was a very challenging time to know what to expect in terms of how we could support our family in, in hospital, if we were even going to be admitted into the hospital, um, to, to be able to sit with them and support them. Um, a lot of uncertainty through the pandemic. Um, and you know, definitely changes in how care was accessed um, in terms of having to have prenatal calls, uh, prenatal visits over the phone or, or virtually. Um, and you know, for, for the families that were impacted by the evacuation policy as well, now having to travel out to birth when we're all being told not to travel and um, not being able to bring the support people that they would have liked to bring with them um, because of the pandemic, that's been very, very stressful and very hard on families. And then of course in November um, 2020, we also had the release of the In Plain Sight report. And I think probably most people on this call are fairly familiar with what that is. Um, you know, recognizing really um, in a big, powerful, impactful way that yes, racism exists. This is what we've known for a long time as indigenous people. Um, but now we have, you know, this confirmation um, that racism and it does exist in the healthcare system that anti-Indigenous racism exists and that it really does dispropor disproportionately impact Indigenous women. So um, I just want to acknowledge that this slide um, compared to the last slide, we do start to see a shift in some of those policies that are impacting um, birth as a site of ongoing colonization. We do see work towards um, reconciliation, but we need truth to go along with that reconciliation. And I think there's some important work here that we all need to be familiar with the, um, the TRC, the, tr the um, Truth and Reconciliation of Canada, the, the missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls and two-spirit um, relatives. We need to all be familiar with that and um, really internalize that in our work. So we know that there are still harms being done and we still have a lot of work to do to heal. And so here's a quote um, pulled out of the In Plain Sight final report. This is a witness shares account of racism in the delivery room. An obstetrician told this review about the terrible treatment received by an indigenous woman who has a history of trauma and sexual assault. The woman attended a BC hospital to have a child by C-section. Prior to the procedure, the obstetrician witnessed an anesthesiologist manhandling and yelling at the patient. The same anesthesiologist later made the statement that people like her should be sterilized. So this really speaks to the fact that just because that legislation was repealed in the 70s, it doesn't mean that attitudes have changed or that practices have changed. This headline is just from, what was that, 10 days ago, May 21st. We see claims that Indigenous girls have been forced to have IUDs inserted as birth control um, by their social workers. I think the shock in this headline um, is frustrating to me because I, I don't think it should be shocking. When you look at the previous slides, the many, many years that these policies and practices have been in place, I don't think we should be shocked that these practices continue and that harms continue. I think we should be outraged, disheartened, frustrated, but not shocked. This is the reality of the healthcare system that we work in, that even though policies change, it doesn't always translate into change in practice. And I think that's where we really need to, to work on, you know, recognizing that our health system really was built on racist policy. And that policy, you know, even if those policies change, the system still retains that foundation of racist attitudes and assumptions and norms and practices. 
So I think we all want to believe that violence and genocide are events of the past, but we know that they're not, that, the, that there's continuing impacts today. And I think headlines like this often make us feel like, what can I do? You know, it can feel really hard to face these kinds of headlines and, and the news that we've had this week can feel really overwhelming. So when I think about what we can do, what each of us as individuals can do, I think it's really important to recognize that the work that is ongoing toward colonization overarchingly can contribute to decolonizing health. So if we look at all of this work that's been done, the RCAP, TRC, Missing Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls and Two-Spirit Relatives, and now In Plain Sight most recently, these all lay out recommendations, calls to action, calls for justice, and very clear recommendations in approaches that we need to take to decolonize Canada and the various systems, including the healthcare system. And so I see it as all of our collective work to operationalize those recommendations and those calls to action within the systems where we have influence. So one of the traditional teachings that I carry is that um, when we hear information or a story, we have to hear it four times before we can really be expected to understand it fully and teach it to others. And so I'm being generous here because these stories have been told in many other places in many other forms for many, many years. But if you take RCAP, TRC, Missing Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls and Two-Spirit Relatives and In Plain Sight, four big pieces of work that have been done that have included voices of many, many Indigenous people who've been impacted locally and across Canada. I think we need to honor the work that's been done here. Again, for all of us to really familiar, familiarize ourselves with, which, with what's in here. And once you have, now you've heard it four times and now it's your responsibility to carry that and to teach others and to take action. So I think we all have to really pick where we can influence. What systems do we work in? Do you work in health? Do you work in education? Use your gifts. Are you a writer? Are you a storyteller? Are you an artist, a listener? Are you a parent? Are you a volunteer? Are you a teacher? Do you influence policy? Do you influence funding? What can you do in your roles in your system, look at those calls to action, look at those calls for justice, those recommendations and those reports and highlight the ones that sit with you, that resonate with you, that think I can do something there. There's a lot of recommendations in there and we can't all do all of them. We need to work together. So find where you can have your influence. And I think it's really important that we get creative when we think about how we can operationalize those recommendations. Um, look at your local community. Where do you work? Where do you live? Where do you play? What kind of work is going on there? Um, what are the local indigenous people doing? Um, how can you support them? Learn about your local nations, learn about the land that you are situated on, um, the history of that land, the, the current events of that land, and how can you support the ongoing work to decolonize? I also want to acknowledge that this work is already underway in terms of approaches to decolonizing birth and reproductive health. And I really want to honor every single indigenous baby that is born because that is resurgence and that is resistance. Every two spirit and queer and non-binary person that loves themselves for who they are, that is resistance and resurgence. Every baby wrapped in a moss bag, every baby carried in a cradle board, that is resurgence and resistance. And this work is happening. So I really want to raise my hands to all of the indigenous people who are out there celebrating our reproductive wellness 
and reclaiming the power of indigenous birth and indigenous parenthood. I also really want to celebrate and honor indigenous midwives. I want to, um, to acknowledge the incredible work of the National Aboriginal Council of Midwives. And I've uh, included a screenshot here. Um, they have on their website three position statements that they released. I don't know if it was last year. I've lost track of time in the last couple of years anyways. Um, so they have a position statement on um, evacuation, the evacuation policy. Um, to, they call for ending that uh, evacuation policy. They call for ending indigenous child apprehensions and they call for ending forced and coerced sterilization of indigenous people. Um, so if you work in health, if you work in sexual health, I highly recommend that you go read these position statements on their website, um, indigenousmidwifery.ca, I believe. Um, because there's some really specific recommendations in there as well. So there are recommendations um, related to birthing in, in the TRC in the um, um, missing and murdered indigenous women, girls and two-spirit relatives. Um, but I would also say that the recommendations here by the um, National Aboriginal Council of Midwives take an additional step in helping us operationalize what can decolonizing birth look like um, so I highly recommend that you go look at those and, and consider how you can support Indigenous midwives and the work that they're doing and the leadership that they're, um, that they're, that they offer. I think it's really important when we think of approaches to decolonizing birth and reproductive health that we center Indigenous practitioners and Indigenous leaders and Indigenous parents. Um, when I think about how we're going to change systems, um, it's a big ask and it feels overwhelming, but we each have a piece of it. So I think about, you know, the practitioners who are wondering, you know, how can I take the cultural safety training workshop that I did and translate that into practice? I think if you have the opportunity to meet an Indigenous birth worker, um, please learn from them, witness them, witness how they interact with clients in the birth space. Um, they're role modeling to you what cultural safety looks like in the birth space and what anti-racism looks like in the birth space. So learn from your indigenous peers. Um, in terms of research, same thing, we have incredible indigenous researchers doing amazing work and knowledge, um, knowledge production and knowledge exchange and knowledge translation. Um, learn from our beautiful indigenous researchers. Um, and policy too, we really need to see indigenous leadership at these tables that influence policy. And I, I hope that that will be the case with um, you know, upcoming um, action plans to, um, to implement DRIPA. And then also at the Canadian level, if there's changes coming to federal legislation to have indigenous voices represented at those tables and leading those conversations. Um, and you know, when I think about how research policy and practice inform one another, um, I really think we need to have a greater sense of urgency around decolonizing healthcare and decolonizing birth specifically. And if COVID has taught us anything, it's that when there is a sense of urgency, we can rapidly respond with policy change and with practice change. Overnight, we were able to see hospitals change their policies, to see providers change their practices in response to COVID. And I think we need to treat racism in the healthcare system and ongoing colonization of birth with the same sense of urgency that we need this change now. So one way that I'm trying to do this in my own way in, in the roles that I have is to hold space for Indigenous birth workers. Um, if you can't tell already, already, I have so much respect and love for Indigenous birth workers. And I think it's really important that within the system, we center and amplify those voices that we hear from Indigenous birth workers about the work that they do. Um, I think something that's really powerful about Indigenous birth workers is that they work in that intersection 
and that interaction between community and the healthcare system. And so I think they see a lot of what people who are only in the healthcare system see or people who are only in community see. As indigenous birth workers, we're walking in that in-between space and we have those perspectives both to bring. I mentioned earlier that I have practiced as a full spectrum doula. And just in case anyone's not familiar with what that means, um, I like to frame it as kind of two, twofold. One in that as a full spectrum doula, we support all pregnancy outcomes, um, including termination, um, loss, um, a pregnancy that doesn't end in a live birth um, or adoption. Um, and so I think that in and of itself is decolonizing birth as well, that we support all reproductive health outcomes. Um, and then also the other pillar is that we support all Indigenous people, including queer, two-spirit, non-binary, trans people who are pregnant um, or welcoming babies into their families. Um, and this is another way of decolonizing is being really inclusive in the way that we do our work um, and building safety for all of our relatives and all Indigenous families in whatever way that they're created and brought together. So I really hold up Indigenous birth workers as the gold standard or best practice, whatever language you want to use. Um, of what anti-racism and cultural safety looks like in the birth space and in reproductive health services. So I really encourage you to reach out and support Indigenous birth workers, um, but I also want to recognize that uh, they are incredibly busy and work tirelessly to serve community and deserve really to be compensated for their time and for their knowledge and for the emotional labor that they do in their advocacy and their education. So if you're gonna ask them to come do presentations or to um, you know, come do training for you to please recognize that often they are self-employed working in community and they, they need supports um, to continue the work that they do. So when I think about what is, what is my hope and vision for Indigenous birth in the future moving forward, um, we probably aren't going to return to birth looking exactly the way that it did in the 1800s because life is different now. Um, we have access to different technology and different medicines and um, you know, we, we need to try to um, recognize that um, what we view as a perfect birth experience may not be someone else's perfect birth experience. Um, so let's try not to assign what our own preferences or assumptions um, for what a perfect birth would look like um, would be to other people. Um, but my, I guess, call to action to everyone here on the call today is that if you aspire to be an ally, you consider yourself an ally in training, um, then I hope that you'll really help to do some of this heavy lifting of decolonizing birth because my, my vision and my hope is that for us as Indigenous people and Indigenous families and birth workers that we can really invest our energy in reimagining how we see Indigenous birth and reproductive justice um, and being able to you know, be on the land, sit with our plants, sit with our aunties and dear elders and learn from one another and have our allies doing some of the heavy lifting of transforming systems of oppression. Um, so I want to share um, this quote um, that I just think speaks really beautifully to how we can support um, decolonizing approaches to birth. Indigenous women may choose to forego customary practices, even if they do have access to them for any number of reasons, and they should not be shamed for that decision. It is the ability to, to decide how they will give birth, where they will give birth, and who will be present during the birthing process that is crucial. Overall, Indigenous women must be free to choose. The act of Indigenous birth is at its core an act of radical love. And that's what I've really aspired to support as an Indigenous birth worker and now in my work um, in the healthcare system within BCH. So a while back, I had the privilege of having a really beautiful conversation with an Indigenous researcher 
um, who at the time was working on her PhD. She's now completed her PhD. So Dr. Gladys Rowe, um, the, the title of her dissertation is Resurgence of Indigenous Nationhood, Centering the Stories of Indigenous Full Spectrum Doulas. Um, I'm super nerdy and get really excited when someone sends me a dissertation in the mail. <laughs> So I've been carrying this around with me for the last few weeks and I absolutely love it. There's so many beautiful stories in here. Um, but I, I had the chance to um, inform her research work by uh, having a very beautiful conversation with her. And I'm really proud of the knowledge that we co-created together. So as part of that process, um, what um, Dr. Gladys Rowe did is she um, wrote a poem using some of the words from our conversation. And so I just wanted to wrap up by reading this poem. And it's called, I Will Witness. The work I do as a doula, it's about relationship building, getting to know each other. I'm gauging, what do you want from me? How can I best support you? What can I offer and bring to the table for you? I find that goes naturally and flows easily. With each family, it varies. Working in the urban indigenous environment, clients come from different nations, cultural backgrounds, differing degrees of familiarity or connection to their culture. Some know exactly what they want to bring into their birth experience. For others, it's not really a priority. Maybe they're a bit curious. For some, it's building connections and community, planting a seed. Sometimes it's about someone else there who's indigenous. I've had clients who hired me I want someone there who's on my side. I'm worried about child apprehension. Even if there's no reason why their child should be apprehended, just being an indigenous mom in the back of their mind, they worry. I can be an extra buffer, offer that sense of safe safety. I'm not, I'm accountable to them as their doula, no agenda. Witnessing as a Coast Salish person, that resonates. In the broader doula community, there's debate whether or not doulas are advocates. As an indigenous birth worker, there's no debate. To debate is a luxury we don't have. Our roles as advocates start long before we're in the birth space. It's a matter of survival. It doesn't mean that we speak on behalf of our clients. Our advocacy goes broader, social determinants of health, housing, access to food, to local resources, being able to connect to our elders, being able to connect to our land. We are advocates. When I think of cultural ways I support families, sometimes it's simple, gathering medicines, which family members will be present. If they have a role to play, who's going to cut the cord? Who's going to say the first way, words to baby in their traditional language? Who's going to prepare the placenta? In the birth space, smudging, having traditional songs, music playing, prayer using water because water is medicine, recognizing the physiology of birth itself as ceremony. A lot of our indigenous ceremonies to some degree have elements of pain, endurance, sweat, tears or blood, moaning, vocalizing, taking different positions. All of that can occur in our ceremonies. I think people at first feel intimidated to have a ceremonial birth. I have to have an elder present, have my traditional medicines, for a lot of the urban indigenous families I work with, that might not be possible. Offer reassurance, being present in the physio physiological process itself can be ceremony. After I returned to work after my first daughter was born, a student intern was doing a project within the organization, reaching out to people to share their birth stories. What traditional elements did you bring into your birth? What ceremony did you practice in your birth? I didn't have all the words at that time to describe birth as ceremony. I kept saying, I birthed my baby. That was the traditional part of it. I birthed her. I remember being disappointed none of my story was shared. You can have a hospital birth, an epidural, a C-section that can be empowering and beautiful and ceremonial. You can call your ancestors into the room with you. I went in with the intention of it being ceremonial. That's how it felt to me. The teachings that we're doing to train up new Indigenous birth workers is really exciting. We're building up this great resource for our community. I'd love to see a wor world where doula training was part of life skills training in high school. Everyone walked around with this skill set to be empathetic, to hold space for others, to feel confident holding one another up. 
I see, I see people come into our training and realize, oh, I already know how to do this. The light bulb comes on. Oh yeah, I know how to support people in this way. All I'm doing is going in and reminding families that they know this too. So thank you for listening. That's what I had to share today. I have my list of references and resources here. I'm sure there's lots of researchers on the call that are spotting <laughs> spotting that I don't have perfect uh, uh, adherence to the various different ways you're supposed to <laughs> write your references. I got most of the information there. You could probably find them. <laughs> I think there's a mix of Vancouver style and APA in here, but anyways, forgive me. It's been a while since I've been in school. <laughs> there's still time for questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Miranda. Um, you know, it's really sticking with me. Um, some of the beautiful words that you said and brought to everyone's attention, but, you know, with what's been happening over this past few days and the really widespread um, grieving that our communities have been doing, um, when you say, I want to honor every Indigenous baby born, because simply that is resurgence and resistance. I really want that to stick with everyone here, that simply bringing our babies into the world in ceremony, reclaiming and honoring those traditions is such an integral part of decolonizing of reconciliation. Um, and I raise my hands to you for all the work that you do and for sharing your knowledge. I just want to um, go towards the chat and see if anybody has any quick questions. Um, maybe while I'm waiting for questions to come in, um, I could pass to Elder Roberta to add any thoughts as well on Miranda's beautiful presentation. Just raising my hands up, uh, saying hi to the OCM, Miranda, to all our birth workers out there, and quite a number of you I have been in, in connected to and involved with, and that is so very, very important for our beautiful, beautiful moms of all ages to have each and every one of you involved in this journey. That really makes those births and the moms and babies feel so safe. So very, very safe. So I hold my hands up to each and every one. I want just as many birth workers out there as there are doctors and nurse practitioners and nurses. OCM, OCM, thank you. Thank you for listening. I don't have any, you know, very pointed questions in here, Miranda, just of course, you know, praise for all the work that you do and everything that you shared. Um, you know, one thing I just want to give you the opportunity to um, add is, you know, from your perspective, some of the next steps that we need to take in our systems, in our work to support Indigenous birthing, to support the decolonizing of birthing. Um, you know, what, what are some of your visions for, for where we can go from here? Sorry, sorry. I can't, I can't multitask. Um, I can multitask in many, many things, but I was just looking at the, all the beautiful chats and, and my vision in going forward is to really, um, I, I saw this uh, beautiful chat there. That's why I was distracted, Brittany and everyone, where it says, you know, that our allies do all the heavy lifting and moving and shifting that out of the way so that the birth workers and doulas and the midwives can actually work without having to do that advocacy. That's the draining part of, of your life is doing, doing the advocacy against so much resistance to Indigenous ways of knowing and doing, that that way be cleared and that the women, the moms, the, the, the families, they all have that personal choice of how and where and who they want to get involved to give birth where and that's the most important journey 
most important journey of all our lives. And this is what I want the larger society, the larger world to recognize that it's just not a thing you do. It is the most important ceremonial piece of your life and that we bring that back to the highest respect. OCM, OCM, thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Roberta. Thank you, Miranda, for all of your sharing. Um, I'm so glad that, you know, this presentation has given the opportunity for, you know, everyone else out there to witness um, your brilliance and commitment to this work, Miranda. So I'm just so proud and honored. Um, and I want to just pass to Elder Roberta to wrap us up because we're at our time. All right. That went by so quick. Yes, thank you so much, Miranda. That was so beautiful, so beautiful from the heart, from the heart. That's the most important. So I'll close us off with a blessing and a prayer. Thank you to each and every one of you for listening with your, not just your mind, but your heart and your spirit as well. So I thank you for that. Haichka, Haichka Osiam, Osiam. We give you many, many thanks, Creator, for bringing us all together in this very wide virtual circle to listening to one of our beautiful matriarchs share Indigenous ways of knowing and doing around birth work and to honor all those, honor all those beautiful birth workers out there right across this nation that they call Canada. And we are kindly and ask you creator to wrap each and every one of us and all of our loved ones, all the beloved moms, parents, families in your warmest blanket of protection as we all journey through this part of the journey of our lives. We always give you many, many thanks creator as we ask you to bring all of your blessings down upon all the ones that are hurting, all the ones that are hungry, all the ones without homes and especially creator, all the ones that are hurting. Haichka, Haichka OCM, OCM. Thank you so much, Brittany. Thank you, Miranda. And thank you to each and every one of you on this, this Zoom meeting here today. OCM, OCM. <laughs>